Um, yes, as, as you may have guessed, um, this, this is um, kind of an interesting, uh, you know, transformation of um, final course evaluations and final class presentations from a DH class into a roundtable. Um, the, the class, um, as, as you might have guessed from our affiliations, uh, you know, took place at, at Stanford in, um, you know, in the fall of 2020. Um, what I'll be doing is um, I'll, I'll be the, the slide DJ and I'll be going through. People will request me to change slides um, and, and we'll see if we can do it together. And I, I, I feel like the somewhat improvisational nature of this really captures the spirit of, of the course that we um, you know, all, all went through together. Um, and um, you know, some of the joys and challenges of, of working across multiple languages um, in the DH classroom. So with that, um, here, here we go. Um, so one of the challenges, um, you know, for people working on digital humanities, particularly doing computational text analysis work in languages other than English, is, is the um, technical resource gaps um, and related to it, the pedagogical resource gaps. <clears throat> just because there are workshops at your institution about you know how to do text analysis how to do natural language processing things um even how to use something like voyant um you know all of those examples um are are almost exclusively drawn from english and if you're working on a different language um you can't necessarily apply english language methods um just directly to text in other languages and have it work um there have been other courses that decenter English in their DH pedagogy, um, but they've tended to be more conceptual, um, you know, talking about theory, talking about, you know, how DH is practiced um, in certain places or limited in their linguistic range. Um, for instance, there, there are, um, you know, workshops this summer um, by Paul Virthaler and others um, on East Asian DH. Um, but as far as I've been able to tell before this class, there hasn't been a, a course that um, literally throws open the doors um, and says, you know, come bring any language you want. Um, teaching a practical hands on course that is open to any language is extremely time consuming, um, you know, which perhaps explains why no one has decided to undertake this. Um, and, you know, it, it may be impractical to offer a course like this everywhere. Um, but materials from this course and that other people are developing in the space, um, you know, may be incorporated into, um, you know, courses that are already, you know, mostly English oriented in order to better support the, um, you know, kind of the DH scholarship of people who don't ultimately want to apply uh, what they're learning to English. Um, I, I'm in a very strange position at Stanford. I am um, library staff. I half in the library, half in the department. Um, and so it, it's a really unique position where um, and I have the freedom to be able to spend so much time developing, basically building a course, you know, six or nine times, you know, depending on how many languages are involved. This, this obviously is not something that, that is feasible for most people, but we're hoping that, you know, this course and, you know, what comes after it um, is able to serve as, as scaffolding in, in more contexts. Um, so this course is pedagogically challenging in person and online. I, I taught it once shortly after I started at Stanford in winter 2019, um, which was, you know, a completely exhausting marathon. Um, and then there was 2020. I don't think I need to say um, necessarily much more than that. Um, in winter 2019, uh, it was held in person and we had like about 10 students, um, which was a lot, um, but, but not anything near what we had in fall 2020, where it was online asynchronous and we had about 20 students. Um, and um, of those, there was a small amount of linguistic overlap between the languages, but not a lot. Um, and there was some a reasonable amount of linguistic overlap with what I had taught before, but there were new languages, um, you know, thanks to Merve, uh, we got to enjoy some, some challenges of right to left, which, um, you know, I, I was always happy to tackle, but glad I didn't the first time around. Um, there were major revisions between the first and the second iteration. Um, the, the first time, I think I maybe went a little bit too extreme um, in terms of kind of like radically different pedagogy. Um, there were no required readings, for instance. Um, and I think this, this was a helpful kind of scaffolding and, and more familiar thing for the students um, to, to actually have some readings um, as the basis of discussion uh, this time around. Um, and there was also more, more coding via Jupyter notebooks, which we had some, some technical and infrastructure um, adventures with um, this time. Uh, there were more Slack and one-to-one -one meetings and less um, like physically looking over people's shoulders at their laptops, um, which again, sort of like exploded the time involved in this course to do it asynchronously. And basically, you know, in, in some cases do this as like 20 independent studies. 
Um, and, and, you know, we, we missed out on the opportunity for people to end up clustering together based on, you know, whether they were Windows or Mac people rather than by language and sort of helping each other out by operating system, which was um, kind of an interesting uh, community building thing we had the first time around. Um, so what we'll be presenting to you today here um, is some examples of the student work and experiences in the course. Um, you know, what, what actually is feasible to do, um, you know, during, during a 10 week quarter um, and, and for that matter, like a, a 10 week, like, you know, just sort of extremely stressful and like, you know, nationally disruptive and like chaotic for everyone quarter at the end of a traumatic year, um, you know, so keep, keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, some reflections on um, we'll, we'll be going next with the, the next evolution of this course. So, Mervin, take it away. Okay, sorry, I almost couldn't unmute myself. So I'm, um, I just presented my work. So it's uh, like uh, the environment is like shared again right now seems like very you know, fruitful. And um, yeah, I basically worked on training a, uh, a model using a program called Transcribus, an EU funded soft software to read Ottoman Turkish documents. And in terms of like the 10 week feasibility, the advantage that I had was I already had a data set, like a set of documents that I've transcribed with me for like a different research that I'm doing because I'm at the history department and I use those for my paper. So my data was half baked, you know, like I already had some stuff. And then can I have the next slide, please? So this is sort of like an image of the, the kind of documents that I dealt with. And because I was able to sort of use my own work that I've literally like invested a lot of time in, 10 weeks time frame was manageable. So I don't think it is going to be applicable in cases in which there isn't already like a certain like familiarity and set of documents that students can work with. But then if there is, and which is the case for actually a lot of PhD students at history that they have, if they're in like uh, later stages of their program, they probably have a lot of transcribed documents that they're, they're keeping in their the personal archives. And they, that might be useful in, in any transcripts project in the classroom setting. But then the first difficulty I had, can I have the next slide? Um, briefly mentioned, the way that during that class, the transcripts software did not have its most recent update that came out like last month. It meant that like, because I'm using a transcription which from takes up from Arabic script from right to left and transcribes it in, in a Latin based script that is more similar to modern Turkish from left to right. It meant that I would have to like upload the text in a reverse fashion. And which was the part where I um, sort of was really grateful to get help from outside and particularly from Stefan Kurnazalton and Queen made the introduction. So I think this really adds to the value of like who runs the course and someone like Queen has incredible contacts all over the world and I'm not like overstating this and who has, you know, like a grasp of like what is going on in the most sort of like current sense of, of the H research it becomes really like it was really helpful to be working with a person like that because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to make the connections and maybe even wouldn't be able to like encouraged enough to do a to pursue a project like this without already seeing like an example of a person who has like done um similar work and you know like someone I could bounce off ideas off of because you know if I could have used Arabic script and kept sort of the original or not like that was a discussion I had with people in the field which of Ottoman studies so that was also like aside that, you know, aside from like being in a multiple DH space, it is nice to be able to like contact these expert knowledge that like an individual instructor might not have access to and is actually not really expected to have the access to. And um, can I have the next slide please? And this is just an image from the software like to show you what it looked like and what the documents look like. So I had, um, I didn't have like that big of an issue with like generally adapting to the software, but I had a lot of like minor questions that I could reach out to Queen with and then like, oh, what should I do with this line? I couldn't read this word. How should I like tell transcribus that I was not able to read a single word in the middle of a line? You know, how should I go about it? And all of these, these aspects of having someone to like, both like help and guide you and bounce ideas off of was like very helpful in, in stages like this that where I needed like a colleague to have, you know, like next to me. And can I have the next slide, please? 
and this is the Slack emblem. So, uh, and the reason for that is we basically mainly write on Slack and or like talk on Slack. So it's um, yeah, and then it sort of like amplifies the feeling that this was more like an independent project that I was independent research project that I was getting support for and it was like structured support so it wasn't like I'm here I'm available like whatever it was structured support and regular sort of like following keeping up with like certain stages and that like that is the difference to like because as far as I know Queen is also generally available because of their library position to like you know students who have similar issues but then again it's um having the specific setting and context of a class made it easier for me to reach out and made even encourage me to like be more sort of there and be more exploring my, you know, like my project ideas. And um, yeah, but then that also came with a sort of like a lack of cohort and class feeling, which we tried to amend in the middle of the quarter. But I know that this, this is going to be a collab between Canada and, and, and the USA next quarter. Um, so I'm hoping in that context, we will be able to like where the, the next uh, cohort of this class will be able to come up with different ways of accommodating the um, the class feeling and the, the sense of cohort. But, and I also love the audio lectures versus uh, like visual lectures. They were really sort of helpful. And I think it's an accommodation that all instructors should think about like if they really do need the visuals or not. <laughs> it, was, it was nice to like, rest my eyes and be actually able to like listen to something and um yeah that's pretty much everything from my end i'm i can pass the this microphone to i think eric kim is that yeah um thank you marva for that presentation and also thank you to gwen for designing and teaching such a such an amazing course um i think i'll start with my brief reflection because once i start talking about horses i kind of lose control of time um but yeah in terms of the individual support that was offered to each student it was really incredible um, because you know you there were 20 students with such vastly different interests and um, Quinn was somehow able to connect with each individual student and it it led to this level of accessibility that I really hadn't seen in any other course um, between the pre-recorded lectures and the individualized assignments uh, you could really take the course at your own pace and develop the skills that were relevant not only to your project but also to other fields that you might be related to um and just like on a personal note i only had pretty much eight weeks during that quarter but quinn was still able to work within that framework and um here is a project that kind of represents what quinn was able to teach someone with minimal experience in and exposure to digital humanities in general. So my project loosely involves the different ways in which horses might change or shape texts written in the Russian Empire during the late 19th century. Overall, research on animals and ecology is becoming more popular in Slavic studies, but most of the focus has been on Dostoevsky with his famously abused horse in Crime and Punishment and Tolstoy with his various horses in war and sports scenes in his longer novels. As someone born into an aristocratic landowning family, Tolstoy wrote not, not only wrote about horses, but also bought and traded them. And his interest in horses translated into these weird metaphors that you can see in his letters. Like uh, he's comparing Turgenev and Dostoevsky in one letter. And he says that Turgenev will be remembered as the better writer because he is like a horse without any imperfections whereas Dostoevsky is a horse with many imperfections and people in the future won't read him. Um, now in the 21st century, the average international reader might find some errors to this reasoning. Um, but the interesting question to me wasn't the veracity of this opinion, but rather Tolstoy's manner of articulation. In the letter, he relies on the language of horses to illustrate his point about writers and artistic longevity. Um, Quinn, sorry, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so, uh, simply put, um, there are just too many collected volumes of the various drafts, letters, and diaries written by Tolstoy to feasibly track down every single horse. And I think if anyone here has tried to read War and Peace or Anna Karenina, like you, you'll, you will feel this problem. Um, it's an especially daunting challenge because of the large variety of horses, uh, of, of words related to horses. 
because Tolstoy was such an expert, his use of highly technical language was not all too surprising. And in fact, his reliance on such terminology was one of the key issues critics mentioned when reviewing his story about a horse, Hostomer. In order to confront this problem, it made sense for me to look for new ways to systematically approach these large bodies of text. And just as a point of reference, these, this word count doesn't include the volumes that are entirely drafts of War and Peace in Anna Karenina, in which you can imagine there are many more horses. Um, Quinn, could I please get the next slide? Thank you. And uh, so in the course, we first started out with data, um, beginning from the simplest notion of what they are to how to manipulate or refine them based on the project. I mentioned in our first meeting that it would be nice to learn how to code, and Quinn immediately sent me detailed Jupyter notebooks, first to manage very simple tasks and gradually to develop more complex tools using Python. In keeping with the spirit of the course, Quinn eventually pushed me to try to adapt pre-existing code for English language texts in order to analyze my Russian corpus. And despite my ultimate failure to acquire any usable data from this particular part of the course, the experience was still useful in building intuition for what tools are available through digital humanities. Voyant proved to be especially crucial in, in my project, as we'll see in the next slide. Um, Sorry, go ahead. That, uh, that was my poor attempt at a transition. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so after wrestling with Tolstoy for a couple of months, um, I, I also uh, was lemmatizing these other works to make horses more trackable. And at one point while reading Leskov's Achorovny Stranik, I noticed this interesting emphasis on not only horse symbolism and imagery, but language itself. The word for horse was embedded into certain names and neologisms were constructed from horse words. And using Voyant, I could numerically map out the general frequencies of certain words throughout the story. So here's a graph. It's kind of hard to read because there are so many terms, but I was mapping out the different, um, different words that you see with horse, con, iloshid, um, which have these stylistic differences, but also these different person terms, chelovyek, which is just a general person and bagatir as this mythic person that's often associated with horses. Um, and then connoisseur is this Leskovian neologism where he combines French and Russian to, for this you know, uh, person who really knows horses. Um, okay, and um, wait, sorry, could I have the next slide please? Thank you. Here's um, a graph that kind of makes the last graph um, more legible. Um, so I sorted the terms into equine and human terms. Equine mostly refers to instances of kon and loshid, the two basic words for a horse, and human is chelvyek and it's irregular forms because in the plural in Russian, it's, it's irregular, unfortunately. And these words are the most common throughout the text, you know, after prepositions and the verb to be, um, because it's mostly told in past tense. Um, so as, as shown in the graph, horse words mostly dominate the first half of the story until around the, the midsection, at which point there's this love triangle that emerges in chapters 10 and 11. In my reading, the linguistic shift reflects a transformation of subjectivity, which is more strongly horse affiliated in the first half of the story. And, but a temporary reversal takes place during the romantic interlude, um, in which at which point you have more human words. Eventually, something closer to equilibrium emerges after oh, the love interest's apparent death in chapter 18. And at this point, uh, the proximity between the two terms uh, becomes evident, ranging between zero to two occurrences. The greater frequency of human terms at the end of the novel reflects a strange turn when the narrator discusses his responsibilities as a Christian. And while this final use of human terms might undermine my original analysis of the story, it's worth noting the consistent abnormality across Leskov's texts. Um, Gabriela Safran, a Leskov scholar, has termed the has referred to this phenomenon as this literary ricochet technique, um, which she takes from Leskov's writing. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much my project. Um, hopefully, horses are more interesting now. And I think. Um, Right, Courtney's next. Thanks, Eric. 
All right, Courtney. Awesome. Thanks so much. And I just feel a need to apologize in advance to the captioning and um, interpretation team because I am from New York and I talk fast. So please tell me to slow down if you need me to slow down. Um, so my name is Courtney Hodrick. I am a fourth year PhD student in German studies at Stanford. And I'm going to talk a bit about my project for Quinn's course today, but I'm going to focus on the way that Quinn succeeded in making the course accessible to students like myself, who not only may have had a varied background or no background when it comes to using DH methods, but who also may have been initially skeptical about digital humanities more broadly. And with that, can I please have the next slide? So my project for the course ended up focusing on Hannah Arendt and the irony of this was not lost on me. On this slide, you can see a quote from The Human Condition, one of many where she criticizes what she calls the modern scientific worldview, the idea that truth is better expressed in numbers than in language. She says that the truths of the modern scientific worldview, though they can be demonstrated in mathematical formulas and proved technologically, will no longer lend themselves to normal expression in speech and thought. If it should turn out to be true that knowledge in the modern sense of know-how and thought have parted company for good, then we would indeed become the helpless slaves, not so much of our machines as of our know-how, thoughtless creatures at the mercy of every gadget which is technically possible, no matter how murderous it is. And she was, of course, writing in the aftermath of the Second World War, after the promises of modern technology had been proven to be horrifically murderous. Um, so I think we can forgive her fear of tech. But I definitely came into this course sharing some of those concerns. And in particular, I had what I consider the humanist's defensive posture. I was on guard against those who would suggest that truth is better found in a laboratory than a library and wary that computational methods are a capitulation to a world that will only acknowledge truths accessible in the language of numbers. So Arendt would have hated the idea of someone feeding her work into a computer and analyzing it computationally, but I ended up doing just that, which makes this, I guess, the story of how I learned to stop worrying and love the computer. Next slide, please. I think the asynchronous element of this course was the sine qua non, the essential aspect of what enabled that transformation in my thinking about digital humanities. Um, in addition to being able to get help in real time with problems like when word to vec as you can see on this slide, decided that it wanted to parse the letter H as a word, um, which was many hours of debugging. Um, I had the space given the asynchronous course to learn more about the digital humanities without the pressure to commit to an opinion in the first week of class. I think if I had taken this course in a traditional classroom, I probably would have pegged myself as the skeptic and I would have become the class contrarian. And it's a lot easier to change your mind about things when you aren't doing it in front of 20 people and you aren't taking on an identity based on an opinion. And so I think asynchronous pedagogy gives students the space to explore methods that they may have previously been resistant to. And uh, yes, Twitter ended up solving the H problem. Thank you for putting that in the chat, um, which also I think shows the incredible digital humanities community that exists by and through and with the internet and the way that technology enables not just the research, but the community in which that research gets done. Um, so next slide, please. So my biggest language problem in this course um, was a function of 
the corpus that I ended up building. Um, so Arendt wrote primarily in English and in German, and my corpus was a mix of the two. And I didn't think that I would end up wanting to submit my work to conferences or for publication. I was mostly just hoping to explore some methods and learn what was going on when people talk about DH. And so I didn't make very careful choices in the beginning of the course as I was designing my corpus and instead ended up composing my corpus of whichever texts were easiest to get my hands on, which meant that half of my texts were in English, half of my texts were in German, and there wasn't really any rhyme or reason. It wasn't even that, oh, the texts she originally wrote in German, I had in German, the texts she originally wrote in English, I had in English. I really just had a mix of the two. Um, which meant that at every step of the way, I was really not working with one corpus. I was working with two corpora because no matter how good computers are at translating between English and German, computational methods aren't. A computer can't look at Zagen and to say and realize that they're the same thing when you're doing something like dependency parsing. Um, which meant that for my final project, which was pairing the names of individuals Arendt discusses with the verbs that she uses to talk about them to see if there's a difference between who acts and who speaks, speaks in her texts or between what I called political and intellectual history, I had to run all of my analyses twice and each of my corpora was half the size of my actual corpus. Um, so I'm actually now in the process of redoing this analysis um, with a single corpus um, so that I can have more data, larger numbers and really make sense of patterns. Um, but I think that was also a really valuable experience for me because working through the problems posed by this multilingual corpus gave me a really clear look at what we can and cannot do with computers, as well as what is considered on a more theoretical level to be a DH method, something like lemmatizing, and what generally isn't. I would say translation generally is not considered a step in the DH process. You might lemmatize a text, but you probably wouldn't just plug it into Google Translate and keep going. Um, and that then, of course, gets me thinking about whether there has been any work comparing different translations and comparing computationally using DH methods, what people are doing, and then my mind starts spinning out and I start coming up with more and more ideas, um, which I think more than anything, and here we come to the final slide, was the energy that defined this class. It was about learning and it was about joy. Um, what surprised me more than anything was how easy it is to get sucked into learning about new methods and then the questions you can ask with them. I think pedagogically, the combination of theoretical readings, published scholarship that really showed what people are doing with these methods and hands-on work was perfect. It meant that we were constantly learning about new methods on every level, seeing what could be done with them and then trying them ourselves. Um, I think pedagogically this course resembled more than anything else the language courses that I've taught and taken given the emphasis on practice, experimentation, and getting your hands dirty. And everything I learned revealed five new avenues for exploration. And more than anything, I think it was getting to tap into that joy of creativity and curiosity and wanting to learn and wanting to ask questions that got me over my skepticism about digital humanities. Um, in the second half of the quarter, as has been mentioned, we introduced some informal Zoom meetings. And although I started this brief talk talking about the importance of asynchronous learning and getting to confront the methods alone, um, I think the community that these meetings fostered then made me feel like I was a part of something that was much larger than myself. And so I really did appreciate those. Um, I would say overall, 
I learned more and I had more fun in this course than basically any other course that I've taken. Um, so I don't think that the online format hurt the experience, but I do think that a perfect combination might have been an asynchronous course that had maybe something like communal drop-in coding hours where people could sort of come together and debug things, sort of like what happens on Slack, but in you know, the quote unquote real world. Um, but for now, I'm just so thrilled to have gotten to take this course and to have learned more about all of the incredibly cool questions that we can ask with computers. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. I, I, I swear I didn't just pick the students who liked the course. <laughs> I, I welcome more critical feedback and discussion uh, in the Q&A as, as well. Um, all right, next up, uh, Victoria Robart. Thank you, Quinn. Um, okay, so I'll begin now then. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Victoria Robert, a graduate student at Stanford University Center for East Asian Studies, where I study the history of publishing Japanese comic books, manga for North American and Japanese audiences. I am also a um, Japanese language learner with an interest in doing DH with Japanese language materials. Today, I'll discuss how Quinn's class provided the welcoming environment needed for doing this work during a time of crisis, as well as the project I completed while enrolled in digital humanities across borders. Next slide, please. Clamp's Car Capture Sakura, like many popular manga series, was adapted into an animated production, an anime, which then spawned a novelization. Since the novelization has the same target demographic as the anime and manga series, the Japanese used in the novelization cannot have a high degree of difficulty. As a result, Japanese language learners should be able to read this novelization, provided they have an intermediate proficiency. The problem is though, what is this difficulty? Is it quantifiable? If it is quantifiable, how can we use DH to figure that out? Also, is there a framework that accounts for both the language difficulty present in the series and Japanese language literacy for language learners? Based on my past experience working on a library collection, oh, go on. Hi. Um, based on my prior experience working on a library collection for Japanese language learners, I knew such a framework does exist. Todoku. Next slide, please. Todoku is one program active at various universities in North America, which aims to increase literacy for Japanese language learners. I will now pause here to give a definition of this for the interpreter. Uh, Todoku um, combines two characters, which means a lot, um, and then the second character means to read. Um, we usually translate it as easy reading in English, but you might want to translate it as lots of reading, because that's ultimately the goal of the program. Okay, so for the Todoku program, Reading for literacy is also a form of reading for fun. Manga and novelizations of anime based on a manga series is quite popular among Japanese language learners reading for fun. But how does the Todoku program attempt to categorize the language difficulty present in these texts? Six levels were developed, beginning with number zero and ending with number five. Level zero may include texts which are nearly text-free, and level five, texts a secondary school student in Japan would enjoy reading. Per this slide, you can see another metric present, which um, is alongside the other levels established for the Joku program. That is the Japanese language proficiency test, commonly known as a JLPT, which begins with N5 and ends with the most proficient level, N1. Since each JLPT level already has an associated Todoku level, I needed to figure out which aspect of the exam I wanted to apply to the Car Capture Sakura novelization, since the exam tests Japanese language proficiency in a few different ways. What from the JLPT is most easily quantifiable? The answer is kanji, Chinese characters used alongside the two syllabaries found in written Japanese. Next slide, please, Quinn. As the Car Capture Sakura novelization was available as eBooks, there was no need to digitize them. I used tokenization to remove characters which were not kanji while also creating an accurate count of how often each kanji was present in each book. This was possible thanks to a method developed by Paul O'Leary and Khan, which I then used in a Jupyter Notebook running Python. Now that I had all the books broken down to list of kanji and how many times that particular character occurred, it was necessary to analyze this against another data set. This data set was a list of the kanji tested on the JLPT exam, which also indicated what JLPT level each 
individual kanji was associated with. Thanks to a Python script, I was able to produce multiple CSV files telling me how often a kanji occurred in a text, what JLPT level it was associated with, and what was its relationship to all other kanji in the text, the ratio. Um, you may view the results of this on this slide. The supermajority of all kanji in the Car Catch Soccer novels are JLPT level N3 or easier. Um, Furigana are also present in the text, which is the syllabary printed over kanji to make their pronunciation clear to readers who have not memorized the pronunciation just yet. This is also often referred to the reading of the kanji as well. Um, therefore, I assigned this series on um, the Tudoku level three, which is the highest level applicable for a text which features both furigana and a supermajority of JLPT and three or easier kanji. Uh, next slide, please. Prior to this class, my experience with dates was limited to digitalization and preservation of materials. Computational text analysis was intimidating because the materials I work with are not the materials most people had in mind when they developed these tools. On this slide, you see both a picture of the novels I ended up working on, as well as a booklet I elected not to work on. I chose not to go with a booklet as the directionality of the text was too complicated for me to digitize effectively. And this is where I would have usually given up. Instead, this class was developed for people doing text with text, um, for people doing DH with text in languages other than English, with the understanding that some tools just won't work the way we want them to due to issues like directionality. As a result, with encouragement from Quinn and my classmates who are knowledgeable about what tools which do work, with materials and languages other than English, I was able to complete this course with a project I was happy with. Next slide, please. Okay. So, but there is a very real problem present in the course, the COVID-19 public health crisis. I listed a few things on the slide, which was used in the class to make it operable during a time of crisis, but I would like to speak more in detail about asynchronous learning paired with synchronous meetings. Um, those meetings have also been mentioned by my classmates throughout this uh, panel today. While I enjoyed the asynchronous learning environment, there was in part due to the presence of a synchronous once a week meeting with a set time in virtual place. These informal meetings allowed me to develop a relationship with my classmates and learn about their own research interests, specifically what tools worked for what languages in a low stressed environment as attendance was optional and no homework or other prep work was required either. This was also a space which facilitated engagement with our instructor in real time without needing to arrange a separate virtual time and place. If these synchronous informal meetings were not present, I would have felt out of place with my classmates and unable to message them in the future about my work, their work, or just school life in general. Therefore, for those of you interested in asynchronous online learning, please consider a weekly or bi-weekly synchronous meeting to complement that. And I will also um, call back to the last presenter and her, her mention of having like a coding in-person meeting as well. I think that would facilitate the same need of our students being able to um, work with each other in a set time, a set place. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, let's hear from Lakmali and their project titled In Transit, Mapping the VC Experience. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, thank you, Quinn, for making this presentation possible. And some of you have already listened to my individual presentation day before yesterday. Um, and I spoke about how it's part of a larger project. Um, and for this, um, what I'm using, sorry, Melissa, I will consciously slow down. Um, so yeah, so this is part of my larger project. And uh, what I talked about in my previous presentation um, on uh, like two days ago, um, was about the Twitter corpus. So for this presentation, I'm going the, the to talk Twitter. About, Ici, je vais parler. about the corpus that has to do with the digitized texts from the 20th and the 21st centuries. So during the time I was taking this course, that was what I was working with. Um, and that was really my first sort of um, attempt to work with a large body of um, digital data uh, for this particular project. And there's a third corpus, which I haven't even started working on, which are transcripts from uh, an oral history project. So really I'm trying to approach this question of visas, which some of you are already familiar with, which is I talked about the core problem and my core research question in my previous presentation. So really I'm trying to approach um, this question of the visas by analyzing three different types of uh, corpora. And today in my presentation, 
I'm really going to talk a little bit more um, about my uh, research, but going through it from the uh, different, like from the other corpus. Uh, next slide, uh, Quinn, thank you. So what are the project details? Uh, so I want to just go through what I have been doing. This corpus consisted of 450, well, it kind of increased after this, but 400 and the base um, uh, uh, number of texts were 450 digitized novels from the 20th and the 21st centuries. The languages I was working with or trying to work with because it wasn't always successful, um, primarily uh, English, French, Spanish, Korean, Sinhala and Tamil. Um, the precondition for the selection of these texts was that these all the novels already had to have references to visa in some form. Um, so I did already make a decision that this um, set of novels is going to be used for this analysis because they dealt with some questions of immigration or visas. Um, so that was a precondition that I used in order to select this particular set of texts from um, everything else. So what one of the most wonderful experiences for me in being in Queen's class is the openness um, and the ability that I had to just experiment. Um, so one of the things I have um, really struggled with before taking Queen's class is when I have a single project in mind, and then I'm so obsessed and I'm so committed with that project that I feel too worried and too scared. And I'm also limited by time, by resources. Uh, as a PhD uh, student, you don't really get a lot of resources uh, while you're trying to write a dissertation for this kind of project where you're learning new skills and when you're uh, learning about new tools. So what this class particularly gave me was the space to fearlessly sort of without really too much at stake to experiment with a whole bunch of tools, which perhaps is not really going to be part of my larger project, but that didn't really matter because now I know about this series of tools, which I might then use in future projects for different purposes, um, perhaps not for this current project, which I've set out to do by experimenting with these tools. So some of the tools that I was able to experiment with, uh, with were like Voyant, word vectors, um, how to do parts of speech tagging, topic modeling, um, NER, geocoding with things like Google Sheets and also using Palladio. Um, so just being able to, you know, every week, just try out one of these tools, test it out, you know, how does this really uh, work when I uh, apply it to my data, that has been a super important experience uh, and a learning um, sort of experience for me. I would never experiment with this amount of tools left to my own devices with my own individual project, never. Um, so for me, this has been like the most valuable uh, experience from this class. And simply because now I know what works, what doesn't work and what works for what aspect of the project. Um, and that's been really great. Um, next slide, Quinn. Um, so this is a sample. So I've used Palladio for both of my uh, corpora. It has its limitations. Uh, now I have decided to move beyond Palladio for the better or for the worse. Uh, but what I did was I used um, um, Google, um, uh, I used geocoding uh, using Google Sheets. And then I plotted on uh, to Palladio and tried to visualize the locations which come up. Uh, and I did this for a couple of novels individually, uh, but as you can see, even for one novel, it's quite um, sort of extensive. The look and this is this visualization is just for American Visa uh, by uh, the Bolivian author Juan Teca Coetia. Um, and even for this single novel, so much you, you can sort of represent so many data points in relation to locations, travel, applying for visas, the travel paths. Um, so I realized, for instance, that Palladio perhaps isn't the best tool for me, although it is a mapping tool and it does give me basic sort of um, uh, uh, basic infrastructure to work with my data. Um, I have also recognized that for the specific visualization I need to work on or I need to uh, kind of enhance upon, this is perhaps not the best way to go. This is not something I knew by reading about Palladio. So I read a bunch of stuff online about Palladio and this goes for other tools as well. So again, this is, to, uh, this is a concrete example to show how you can work through a certain tool without judgment, without being graded for it, without being evaluated for it. Um, because we are all, I think most of us in this course, uh, well, at least speaking for myself, we were new to most of these tools. And there's also this fear of being evaluated for the work we do, especially at a graduate seminar. 
Um, so that lack of judgment, that lack of um, that kind of sort of evaluatory mechanisms, although there were lots of ways to evaluate each student, which I will mention in a bit. Uh, and that was super helpful. Um, yeah, thank you, Quinn. The next slide. Um, so to go a little bit in detail into my experiences with working across different languages, on this slide you see uh, how, in fact, working across different languages kind of helped me in this project, and that's particularly because of the word visa. Um, so I've uh, mentioned here on this slide the lexical similarity. Um, uh, uh, when it comes to the word, the vocabulary item or the lexical item visa. Um, so in English, French, Spanish, you get just it's visa. Um, it, it, there is absolutely no change in the word. Uh, Korean, it's bija, but uh, phonetic, phonetically there is a very close um, uh, similarity between the um, uh, word visa as used in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, in Sinhala, um, it's a visa, um, so it sounds exactly the same. It's really a direct borrowing uh, from the uh, European language, from the Romance languages. And in Tamil, it's again visa. Uh, so phonet phonetically, the word doesn't really change. It's really the script which changes for the word. So although some languages use scripts, which are different from the Latin script, um, phonetically and morphologically, the words for visa are either identical or very similar. So this. Uh, was something um, which kind of also made me um, ma think about the history and I won't go into the details now because I already presented that in my previous talk, but um, there is a deep connection between why these items have similarities across, um, uh, across uh, phonetics and morphology. Uh, that's because the history is so recent and it does not exist in other cultures. It uh, reflects the kind of historical um, background uh, within which the word visa comes into existence. Um, so here I was able to make a really interesting connection to my uh, initial sort of the close reading research I had done. I was able to add a section to my introduction of my uh, dissertation, as a matter of fact, where I did this, I introduced this section on linguistic, phonetic, and morphological similarity between words, which only really occurred to me as I was doing this project. So it's a really interesting sort of how working on this digital humanities project made me sort of think about, uh, not even think about, it kind of gave me a whole new access point to think about the history of the visa from a linguistic point of view. Um, so that was uh, completely uh, unexpected, and it was a, a great way to connect the two projects as well. Um, next slide, Quinn. So um, to wrap up my section of this presentation, I wanted to go through some class reflections. Most of it has already been touched upon uh, by my colleagues already, so I won't go through all of them. Um, I definitely felt extremely sort of included, uh, welcomed, uh, encouraged. I think this is something to do with Queen's personality as well. In general, every time I work with her, I've sensed this. Um, so I think it's very specific to Queen as well. But the fact that it was a community where I felt welcomed, where I felt included, where I didn't, again, felt judged and evaluated critically just because I'm a newbie, just because I'm sort of starting out in this field was very important because I think, um, again, as some of my colleagues have pointed out, this could have gone very wrong. I could have walked out having a very negative experience of DH in general. Um, uh, it was challenging. The learning curve was extremely sharp, um, but I think, um, it, it didn't matter in the end because there was always so much support. Um, so I will move on to, um, I think uh, grade contracts was a great, a great aspect of the class. So I already mentioned that there was no sort of strict um, evaluatory aspect, which made me feel like if I failed with this tool, then that's it. I'm like a failure in the class. Uh, so there were different types of grade contracts that were introduced in this class, which made it very flexible to uh, design your own goals, to design your own sort of way in which you would like to be evaluated. Um, and that could be adjusted based on the goals you set for your project. Um, uh, number five is something I wanted to point out, which I found really interesting, the ability to annotate texts collectively. So most of the reading we did were online. Uh, and the great thing was Quinn um, uh, uh, presented the texts to us in such a way that we were able to collectively annotate all the texts. So even though I was reading the text from 12 points, so I was in a completely different zo time zone. I was 12.5 hours, well, at 1.13.5 hours ahead of PST. 
Um, so I was completely cut away from all my colleagues and Quinn. But um, as I was reading my texts um, for the class, I could see that other people have commented, left feedback, and that was really helpful. So I was in absentia having conversations with colleagues and how they were thinking about the texts and the questions they had about the reading. So that was really useful. Um, again, as uh, other colleagues have mentioned, the recorded lectures the corresponding transcripts because Quinn also made available the transcripts of the class. So if you didn't want to listen to the lectures, you could just um, read the transcripts. And another thing I appreciated about Quinn's lectures when she recorded the lectures, it was audio only, which means that in the middle of that crazy pandemic, while we were trying to manage so many things, you could actually just listen to the um, uh, lecture. Uh, while not necessarily having to look at the screen. So she deliberately sort of um, created that division between the audio and the video aspect, um, which uh, was also like a cool way to help people to like be on track with the class in the middle of everything else that was going on. Um, so those are some of my class reflections. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Quinn, for this really great class. Thanks, Black Molly. Um, all right, oh, let's see. Next up, we have Cecily. Hi, um, I'm Cecily. I'm an assistant professor of digital humanities at McGill University. Um, I'm going to continue the Quinn adoration um, in a few ways. Uh, first, wanted to say that I met Quinn um, very serendipitously over Twitter because she posted like a very brief video about what her class was going to look like, um, and I immediately asked her if she could be a Spectrum speaker, which she was in the fall. We have a series running at McGill um, on digital humanities. Um, and then later we continued our conversations around how to teach multilingual digital humanities with the hope and idea that we will be able to teach a class across two institutions uh, at Stanford and McGill, hopefully in the fall of, um, of 2022. Um, so that's our, that's our big hope. Um, so what, what, uh, what I'll talk about very briefly is what that might look like and some of the experiences that we've had at McGill uh, in terms of uh, how to teach uh, digital humanities across multiple languages. And Quinn, feel free to jump in at any time um, with any thoughts that you have as well. I know this is supposed to be more collaborative. Um, well, so digital humanities in our, in our case at McGill is taught in a language department. So we have Russian, German, Spanish, and Italian. So um, a lot of our PhD students who aren't necessarily digital humanities master students uh, who are doing PhDs in these various languages undertake digital humanities projects, um, both in courses and then also for the dissertation. So this is something that we think about uh, very frequently in our institution. Um, so we're trying to build a curriculum across the undergraduate level. And then we, currently we have an ad hoc master's and we're thinking about perhaps creating a PhD program uh, with all the challenges that that entails <laughs> for digital humanities. Um, also wanted to apologize much like the first speaker did to the interpreter for not having my slides to you earlier. I hope I'm speaking slowly enough to be able to be um, interpreted in the moment. So uh, our graduate program, as I mentioned before, is in languages, literatures, and cultures, but also draws upon a variety of disciplines, including anthropology, English, communication studies, information science, computer science, et cetera. So one of the challenges to perhaps teaching um, a, a dual um, cross-institution class would be how to uh, incorporate uh, the various disciplines that we incorporate for our students on, on, on either end of that, um, on both sides of, of, of this vast uh, North American continent and two countries, um, one West Coast, one East Coast. Um, and uh, so our, our flagship undergraduate course is um, Understanding Digital and Social Media. It's a class that we teach to undergrads and that kind of turns into uh, opportunities for graduate students. Um, and actually, if you hear some noise in the background, one of my PhD students is getting a keynote for the Biodiversity Heritage Library. She's a PhD student in Spanish, but she works on texts uh, in German, Spanish, uh, and, and a number of other languages, uh, colonial texts. Um, so really, this is, these are things that we're doing actively and ongoing. Um, some of the things that we teach in the graduate level include like digital humanities um, uh, methods, including digitization, encoding, analysis, and visualization. You can go ahead, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, in fact, I'm realizing that the bottom of that slide is cut off, but that's okay. I wanted to mention that the colleagues that are doing this work are myself, Andrew Piper, whose work you may know, who's also a Spectrum speaker. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, Richard Jean So, who is in the English department. Um, and he works on intersectional digital humanities. You might know his work. And then finally, Vanessa Sea, who works on a project called Mapping, Mapping the Movida, which looks at texts in Madrid um, and looks at sort of the peripheries of the Movida movement um, and looks at sort of how, to, how do we queer the map around some of those texts. 
So these are some tools that we use in multilingual DH projects at McGill, and I'd love to continue to think about ways of, um, of kind of expanding this, this list with Quinn. I've learned so much by listening to it with the student projects today, and uh, I know that there are challenges with some of these tools. Of course, we're using Gephi, Tableau, Voyant. Um, uh, uh, we're using QDA Minor and also Voyant for, for text mining. Um, and then we're, we do quite a bit of web analytics work. Uh, I'll talk about that a little later as well. Uh, geospatial tools, I think um, there was some kind of uh, sort of critique in the panel about Palladio and, and, and sort of some of the challenges to that. We tend to really focus heavily on uh, ArcGIS. We have JS um, workshops are in the library. I, I imagine that the same thing happens at Stanford, um, as well as uh, with Google Earth um, and using KMZ files. So we had a student that was able to actually map um, uh, some of the protected areas of the Amazon region using Google Earth, uh, and then she ended up getting a full uh, scholarship to go to Brazil and continue that work. So that was pretty exciting. Um, and of course, just really web-based CMS uh, related things. Um, Sometimes getting your feet wet with basic tools, very out of the box tools, can I think be a really nice uh, kind of stepping stone into things that are a little bit more advanced. Um, you'll see that Christopher Cologne in this particular example, this is from an undergraduate class. I try to inflect, I put little digital things in all of my classes, but this is, is of Christopher, Chris, Christopher, uh, Christopher Columbus, if you had a Twitter account, and it says Italiano Autentico, uh, uh, an authentic Italian. Uh, I may have been one of the only followers, but I thought this was a pretty neat way of thinking about how to deconstruct some of his colonial works into small 140 character tweets and looking at the idea of sort of micro narratives, storytelling in the digital space, um, how we could perhaps turn something that's historical into something uh, that would be, um, I see that that's, that, that would be wonderful from a comment, there we go. Um, uh, something historical that could, perhaps could be inflected not only digitally, but also in a contemporary space. Okay, so um, Quinn, could you actually turn to the, the next slide for me? Yeah, just are just some final projects we've had. In this case, I'll show you some from Spanish. Um, but again, uh, we have uh, one colleague working in German studies, English, uh, and two of us are in Spanish. Uh, and then we have, um, I'm actually uh, co-advising a, a, a Russian studies PhD student. I'm also co-advising a German studies PhD student. So often this multilingual work happens even in languages that we ourselves as faculty don't, don't necessarily speak or understand. Uh, in, in my case, Russian is, is a new language for me, um, but I'm sort of stepping in to talk more about the methodological approach to that particular project. Um, and these are things that I'm sure Quinn is also doing at Stanford very much. Um, so yeah, just some, some final projects, Cuban blogging, dissidents in a digital space, Twitter, a tool to strengthen or weaken participatory democracy in Mexico City. Renuncia, yeah, you'll see 3000 tweets that were visualized using Gephi on the right-hand side. Um, looking at um, uh, a hashtag uh, movement called Renuncia Ya or, or, or Resign Now, uh, and the utility of Twitter campaigns and political movements. Can success in Guatemala translate into success in Venezuela? And then finally, Flama, the YouTube videos of the Latin American diaspora. Uh, so just to give you an idea of kind of the th some of the things that we're working on here, um, I think one of the neat parts uh, with, with, of course, its challenges uh, that we could capitalize upon when we teach uh, a co-taught co version of this class is the asynchronous model that Quinn has very um, elaborately constructed. And I think it's something that would work well considering that we have a three hour time difference. Um, I can imagine that that would be pretty helpful to students on both sides of, of this, um, of this uh, large continent that we are occupying. Um, so Quinn, did you have any other thoughts in terms of um, things to add to some of these reflections on how to teach this together? Um, I, I think probably the, the one thing that I would add is, um, that I mean, I think part part of the the gambit that we're we're trying here is um, you know thinking about like is doing this across two institutions um, going to help at all with the like horrible scaling of this class? Like I mean, essentially, like you have to redo all of your course prep for every language that you encounter for the first time, and um, you know for for most of the students, I mean, most of the students didn't have. Um, you know, uh, anyone else in the class who was working on the same language. Um, and on, on one hand, when I taught it in person and there was a little bit more um, linguistic clustering, um, it turned out that like Windows versus Mac was actually the most challenging like division rather than like the human language. Um, but, but still, I mean, you know, if we can get people together from different institutions, could we finally like be able to create like language communities as well as like OS based communities um, is, is kind of um, what we're hoping to experiment with and, and find out. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have yeah, to see no, I think that's a really wonderful point because I think that one of the 
uh, opportunities that we have in opening up the course across two institutions is really the ability to rely on expertise that lies outside of in, in, in an individual institution, right? So it's given how many Russians, Russianists we have, Germanists, um, I know that also your department very much uh, celebrates um, expertise in a variety of languages as well, but perhaps, yeah, as you're saying, we could spread the love and kind of uh, do more crowdsourcing to help students that are working on languages that are perhaps outside of the Indo-European um, model. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and it's, it's, there, there was, I, I, I was sort of tried to do it with um, this version of the class where like, you know, all, all of the materials were available online and I try to sort of make it open to other people outside the, the institution, which worked to varying degrees. Um, but I mean, having, having a group of people who are actually enrolled with the class and, and thereby are, are forced to follow through rather than sort of relying on, on what time is left on the edges of, of people's lives, um, I think will be, will be helpful. Um, all right, with that, is this, is this our last slide? Yeah. Um, yeah all right. Um, yeah, with, with that, um, I, I'm happy to open it to Q&A or if anyone else has feedback, please, I welcome critical feedback. Um, I, I will note that the, um, that the in, in person once a week meetup um, you know, was not actually part of the original plan. Um, and I believe that was Courtney's idea, um, which, which I, I really appreciated and I ended up getting a lot out of too. Um, and um, yes, yes, questions, comments, critical feedback. I, yeah, surely you must um, have exhausted your nice feedback. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I I think that uh, most of us in the audience are really encouraged and excited by this uh, by this wonderful roundtable and also all of the incredible projects that have spun out of this class. Um, I do see that we had one question in the chat that I want to uh, give voice to just to make sure that um, we get to ask answer it on on the video. Um, Maya Dodd asks, is there any way to access your tutorials online? It would be great if there's any way to share these asynchronous digital humanities lessons with students from around the world. I know that you answered it in the chat, but if you could also answer it here, that would be really wonderful. Yeah, well, since, since I'm sharing my screen, let me just pull it up for you. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so all of the materials are available online. They're, they're still slightly um, chaotic and, and, and moderately organized. Um, there's also some things from the first time um, that the, uh, the class was taught in here too. I, I had a, a, the first time around, I did a final project along with the students um, where I looked at, um, you know, use word vectors on uh, the Russian translation of Harry Potter and a um, Russian parody of Harry Potter um, to look at sort of how some of the concepts mapped out differently. Um, but yeah, all of this is here. Um, there were a few other things. There's yeah, there's a little bit of a guide here. Um, I, I also had a, um, a a sort of twine um, kind of choose your own adventure tutorial for text digitization that I hope to build out for for some of the other um, paths following that. Um, yeah, there, there's 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 more to come, and there's also more resources available um, at the multilingual DH um, listing of things. Um, so I'll open another on GitHub.com multilingual DH. Um, and and for day of DH, which is later this month on the 29th, I'm I'm hoping to organize a little bit of a like data gathering hackathon to um, kind of refresh the the NLP resources that we have here for a variety of languages. Um, actually, start building out the the corpus database. This was one of the the projects that I was all fired up for in February 2020, and has you can see 11 months ago, not much has happened um, since then for obvious reasons. Um, but now is the time to to get back into it. So there's there's really a lot of um, a lot of things that that can be done um, fairly easily to to sort of make life easier for for folks who are coming to this. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and thank you for generously sharing these resources and committing so much of your time and effort into putting these online for everyone. Um, we have another question in the chat. This comes from Tiffany Esteban, and the question is for Victoria. Uh, Tiffany says, thank you so much for your presentation. As a fellow digital humanities person and Japanese language learner, I really enjoyed it. Um, how has your project changed the way that you read novels in Japanese? And do you plan on doing this work for other texts? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so actually the project made me think about, um, I think a shared 
nervousness that happens with Japanese language learners is learning a lot of kanji when your native language does not include kanji. And so I focused the project on kanji. And then at the end of it, I realized a much better way to look at this probably would have been at grammar or vocab. And so in a way, it did make me rethink text because I'm like, oh, I can use, I could just use the dictionary for kanji. I need to focus on learning my vocab and grammar, and then I can increase my proficiency and increase how many novels I can read. Um, so I would say that did occur. And um, I, while preparing for this conference and looking over my work again, I was thinking, you know what, I kind of do want to try this again. I want to see what happens when I, um, for example, I just was reading a really nice comic called Shirohimi Show. Uh, tale of the snow goddess i think in english and um i was thinking there's not much text in here i can just type it all up and digitize it quickly i wonder what will happen if i put it through the code so i think this project will um grow and grow and grow which is something that my classmates and i um all experience um i hope that answers your question thank you <laughs> and um going going off of that too uh i have a question for all of the the panelists and our and our participants today um, which is that um, how have these multilingual digital humanities programs and experiences opened up new avenues of research for you moving forward, not just in the work you did in this class, but, but moving forward? Have you found yourself making like conscious decisions to continue to work multilingually and have these experiences encouraged uh, collaboration and working collaboratively with other partners as well? All right, come on, you guys, someone jump in. <laughs> well, yeah, as someone who comes from a field with like a lot of resources that are being are still being digitized, like there, there were certain um, topics that I kind of shied away from because I figured, you know, that's too much reading. You know, I can't read like thousands of these journal articles about, you know, um, raising horses in, in the late, in, late empire. But now like, I feel like there are tools actually to find, okay, now how can we figure out what percentage of people are talking about horses in this region versus that other region, or like, you know, who is more focused on like this breed of horse compared to that one? Like it's it's now become an approachable problem as opposed to, you know, look at these stacks of journals that I will never get to read. <laughs> I can jump oh, in oh, and, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, okay, well, I actually got to present a little bit end of class sort of work back in um, around Thanksgiving time. And um, as a result of that, which was sort of like online presentation as usual, as a result of that, I was able to find collaborators in, in Vienna particularly, and I was able to participate in like a sort of the larger community of like Ottomanists working with transcribers. So, and I, I keep sort of like working on this project. So that was very valuable coming out of this course. Um, I was going to um, respond to Justin's, like especially the first part of the question, like, you know, do I want to sort of grow this project? I think if I didn't take this class, I don't think I would have thought of including French or Spanish or even Sinhala and Tamil, which is actually quite difficult to work with because the, um, there's very little resources which exist. Not much has been digitized, so the burden falls on me. Um, as you know, as soon as I decide on those languages, it will be my burden to also create the corpora for these different languages. Because um, one of the biggest problems is in English language DH, and even you know, it starts at the very basic level with the corpora. Right, the corpora simply do not exist in mostly non-European languages. I'm lucky with French. Um, I'm lucky with Spanish and also because, you know, I, I know what the French texts are because I've studied it for such a long time, I can go out and seek it out. But it's not necessarily the case with um, the minor languages I'm working with, such as Singhal and Tamil, they simply do not exist in the digitized um, sort of universe. Um, and some people do make the mistake of thinking that, oh, you know, these minority languages, these sort of non-Western little herd of languages perhaps do not actually have this kind of literature. And this is something I run across even in non-DH uh, research. So I think uh, for scholars like me who try to work with uh, non-European or non uh, sort of majority languages, which uh, very few people work with, there's a lot of um, 
sort of tedious um, grassroots level sort of work. Um, and for that, I think I really need to uh, collaborate, which is something I have not figured out. But the other great part about uh, learning more about BH and being exposed is that realizing that being collaborative is such a fundamental part of BH communities and DH as a discipline, which is not something I necessarily knew about before I got a little bit more deep into DH as a discipline. I want to say following up on what Lakmali just said about the grass work, work uh, grassroots work um, is that I think more than anything, this course has changed how I think about what academia does and does not consider to be labor. Um, and in particular, this is something that I talked a lot about with Quinn while I was doing things like cleaning texts. I think a lot of us internalize and are sort of brought up in a mindset where what matters is having the genius idea that no one has thought of before and then you publish that idea and you change the field and it's very much about the sort of individual creative new thing and there are so many types of labor be it digitizing texts, be it, you know, cleaning up the things you've digitized, there's so much you need to do just to make any of that sort of, I almost want to call it, and I think it is often a very gendered stereotype, you know, great man thinking possible. And so I think regardless of the methods that I use going forward, I think I'm definitely going to try to keep an eye on what types of my own labor I'm discounting and what I am or am not considering to be, you know, a valid CV line, an accomplishment, et cetera. Um, because I think there's a lot of like I said, discounting and disregarding of all sorts of types of labor that make everything else possible. I think that's a really important point and, and gets to one of, um, you know, kind of what I see as the, the great, you know, unresolved questions and challenges for DH in general um, is, is how do you grapple with the amount of labor that goes into this? And I mean, the, the amount of labor is tremendous working even on, on English projects. Um, there's a, uh, you know, a, a, a side project that I'm working on uh, right now with a corpus of English language Star Wars novels and like the amount of work that, that has gone into, um, you know, trying to kind of clean up and align two different dependency parses of the corpus, one of which tries to resolve pronouns to characters and one doesn't and syncing it all up, um, you know, and then trying to like extract all of the verbs, all of this stuff in English where you have like literally the best in the world tooling to deal with this stuff um, in, in modern English at that. Um, you know, and how much is that labor then multiplied when you don't have such good tooling? Um, you know, is, is this work sustainable literally, like not even in terms of long-term preservation, but you know, like do we have the institutional structures in place to allow students the time and space to do this work? Or do we have the funding available for them to outsource that work to someone else? And what gets lost when they're not the ones doing it and they're not the ones like making the decisions on like a sentence by sentence basis about, you know, what gets tagged, you know, and how, or, um, you know, whether or not to digitize, um, you know, the table of contents, like these, these little things, all of these little choices that we discount as unskilled labor and the sort of thing that like, whatever, like, you know, throw a hundred bucks to, to someone in India to do, um, you know, has has such big implications for the project, not to mention, you know, implications for you know, kind of, you know, labor and ethics, like with regard to, to, you know, the field and, you know, as a whole. So there's, there are a lot of really vexing challenges um, that often get framed as, you know, 
kind of the relationship between like faculty PIs <clears throat> and you know, particularly undergrad assistants. Um, but the, the problems are, are much bigger and, and thornier and, and multifaceted. Yeah, thank you for uh, the very wonderful responses from, from all of you. Oh, Cecily, did you also uh, want to, please? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of uh, second that and also to say that I think going back to the idea of the, the, the multiple micro tasks involved in these projects, um, finding ways of uh, creating a student assessment um, uh, kind of model that gives value to these types of tasks is huge uh, at every level, an undergrad, grad, and then faculty, because there's a lot of work that goes uh, on behind the scenes, which isn't very glamorous, um, especially as we're encoding and annotating large amounts of texts. Um, however, um, you know, if we could find a way to give value to that, I think it would be uh, a, like kind of structured value, institutional value to some of these tasks um, in a way that kind of um, really pays homage to them. I think that'd be really helpful as well. And that's a task that I think all of us are facing in all various institutions. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, I'm really glad uh, to, to hear these really important considerations being given to institutional infrastructures, which kind of calls back to some of our earlier conversations today as well. Um, and this question for, for both Quinn and Cecily, um, in, in trying to create this uh, cross institutional classroom initiative, have you run into any institutional barriers in trying to make this thing happen. Um, uh, Cecily, you mentioned like just the, the very bare bones, like navigating the time differences, which I think is a really good consideration, but um, any other kinds of invisible hurdles you might have come across or um, things that have gone smoothly? And then I also see, I think we have a question waiting from uh, Bert after this. Um, certainly, I, I think I can speak to some of those. Um, I think uh, one of the challenges will, will be uh, gaining access at our departmental level, also faculty level. Um, I've, I've, um, I've advised students who've done PhDs that right now I'm doing someone who's at the McGill and the Sorbonne, but whenever you have anything that extends like, outside of your institution, there are certain um, barriers to entry. And so I think Quinn and I will have to explore what those might look like. Um, from my initial conversations with DH colleagues at McGill, they've been really celebratory of this idea have really been celebratory of Quinn's work also. And one of my colleagues has direct contact with Quinn and talks a lot with her about multilingual DH. So um, I think that there's definitely a goodwill there. Um, but I, I think the bigger challenges might actually be logistic just because of the, of the time difference and also um, working with uh, multiple languages uh, within each of our departments. Um, so how do we do that work? One of the things that Quinn did really beautifully, I thought was to group folks into language um, groups. So everybody working on German would kind of like have their own little space in which they could ask questions and, and, and informally kind of uh, kind of collectively and informally discuss with each other problems and I think that what, what would be really cool is if we could do that also cross institutionally so those perhaps working in Russian in, in, in our department and then at Stanford those working on maybe Arabic texts um, we are fortunate to have I think a lot of the same um, language uh, languages taught at, at the various institutions in our cases but I think that you know I'd like to model some of the things that I want really well in her course in a kind of a grander scale. And I think there could be, we could run up against some challenges to that. I don't know, Quinn, any, any other thoughts besides, besides that? I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm dealing with teaching um, from the institutional angle on easy mode. Um, I mean, Stanford has just so much flexibility and honestly, so little oversight. Um, no one's like, no one's really worried about, um, you know, you know, much of much of anything. Like, if I offer a course, and like, as long as there are grades at the end of some sort, like, what happens in the middle, there's a lot of flexibility with that. I know people at most institutions don't have that amount of freedom, um, you know. So there, there, there are a lot of hurdles that that just avoids. Um, I there will have to be, we'll have to think of some alternative to. Um, you know, Canvas as the LMS, or we'll have to have our individual class LMS plus something shared, um, because trying to get external students authenticated to the Stanford LMS seems like it's inviting way more questions than it's worth. Um, and actually, to that end, you know, with this class for our Slack, we didn't use the Stanford Slack, but we used the DH Slack um, and had a, a you know channel on there for the whole class and tried to have them for individual languages too. Um, and using using that as a way to like get around the university authentication and all of that all of that sort of institutionally tied stuff 
um, is is really essential um, to be able to have yeah cross cross institutional infrastructure. Bon, d'avoir des 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 infrastructures installées à travers les, les institutions. Please. Never mind. Just making yourself visible. Thank you. I, um, okay. Um, if there are any other questions, you can uh, folks can unmute themselves. Um, otherwise, I'm more than happy. I I also have many more questions, but I want to make sure that I can. Uh, give voice to anyone who has a question. I wanted to add something to the like the very last comments about like language clusters. So Please. I guess be working on a language that wasn't really sort of, you know, it wasn't one out of four Latin or like one out of seven Russian or I'm just giving random numbers. I think it like sort of makes sense at least in the beginning to, to be able to create a um, more sort of like an integral sense of cohort to like maybe not start out with that division and then instead start out with a group and then let that division build itself out because I'm sure if you have a Russian speaker working with like Russian focused research working on 16th century versus 20th century that's also going to be like a lot of sort of like differences and they might also not want to be clustered together and it might be easier for someone working in 15th century to work with someone else working in 15th century theoretically so maybe just to like because it's just, it's not only multilingual, it's also like multi-spatial, multi-periodical, like and maybe, yeah, keeping all of that in mind could also help out like for the next round of stuff. Yeah. Um, and going along with that, um, I, I do have a question for, for Quinn in kind of continuing that thread. Um, was there any thing that worked better in the first iteration of this course, the fall, the, the winter 2019 one that um, that worked better in the first iteration and not as well in the second one? Like, is, is there a, like a synthesis to be had of both the, of both of these iterations where there's like, um, I can't remember which, which one of you wonderful presenters said it, but a, a perfect course blending the two? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing that went better is exactly the thing that multiple people have mentioned, which was the the in person debugging, um, you know, and and the scalability of of that. Um, I mean, there's there's only so much that. Uh, I mean, I, I I managed to juggle it, you know, not not least because I you know I didn't have you know a, a ton of other pressing obligations in the fall, um, but you know I, I managed to deal with Slack based debugging of all kinds of issues occasionally, you know, via Zoom when when really needed. Um, you know, the biggest problem is Windows, frankly. I mean, like if I could, if I could banish Windows from the classroom, my life would be so much easier. Um, you know, on all of the computing stuff, it, like there is no one who is working on Windows who had an easy time of it. Um, and and it, particularly the Windows problem debugging went a lot better with the Windows people getting together and helping each other um, the first time around. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I think having, um, you know, thinking through what, how to distribute the different activities of the class through different modalities and different meetings and different meeting times and different kinds of meetings is, is going to be um, an interesting and uh, creative challenge uh, of of the next iteration, um, particularly being in in two different places, um, and the fact that officially, like, I have to have a time and a place with the registrar. So, like, how how to how to deal with that Tetris of logistics and requirements and desires is 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 going to be kind of a a, a fun a fun thing to play around with. Uh, thank you. I think we have time for maybe just one more quick question. Um, Kristen, do we have time for one more question? Okay. Um, seeing none, I will ask one. I kind of want to tie as much of this roundtable together um, because you know the overarching theme is pedagogy. So my, my quick rapid fire question is, how has this experience influenced your own pedagogical practices? Particularly, I, I, I'm very interested in hearing from the student participants uh, here. or planned pedagogical pursuits. <laughs> yeah. So, um, sorry, I, I guess I'll, I'll try a first stab at this. Um, this is also, so I'm in my second year of a PhD program here, which involves teaching. Um, so while I'm also taking courses, 
I'm teaching language. And um, I think Quinn's sensitivity and like her care for each of us as individuals was really like a good reminder of what I should be practicing in my classes too. And um, like, cause unfortunately that isn't always the case in all the, not that I've personally had bad experiences, sorry. Well, now I'm in a hole. But I feel like you, you see it very often in graduate school where professors forget that, you know, the students are human, that grad students are human. So then, you know, working with undergrads who are all taking a language class for purely elective purposes, um, it, was, it was good to have this role model of, you know, an empathetic instructor. Uh, to jump in on and also to reinforce and to um, sort of repeat what Eric has said, um, the human element made a huge difference uh, to me. And I think um, in academia, sometimes we tend to sort of override the human elements in many ways um, in, in an almost sort of very sort of uh, dehumanizing way sometimes. And this connects back to uh, the question of labor that Courtney was talking about, I think earlier. So the human element was um, a really great um, experience to go through. Um, again, it's like, you know, Eric pointed out, it's not because I've necessarily had bad experiences, but this was an ex exceptionally good experience. Uh, then the second thing I wanted to point out was the uh, difference in like the kind of variety in the material that um, Quinn made accessible to us. So there were audio uh, recordings, there were um, uh, readings online, which can be annotated. Um, there could be stuff that we could read on our own if we wanted to kind of bo borrow it or download it from the library and the kind of hands-on experimental tools that we were using. So the kind of variety in teaching material was something, um, again, which was very positive. Again, I mean, I've, again, I've had experience doing this as a teacher as well, because when you teach languages at Stanford I, and I've taught French for a while, uh, you do this kind of, you know, getting hands dirty, kind of hands-on practical approach uh, to uh, teaching languages um, was reflected in this course, which I haven't necessarily come across in a non-language class. Um, so I think that pedagogical aspect I found really useful and important. And the third and the final thing um, is um, in terms of asynchronous um, uh, availability uh, and accessibility to the teaching material. As I mentioned throughout the entire course, I was 12.5 hours or 13.5 hours away, and I couldn't really join in the kind of community uh, meetings um, that some of my colleagues were able to take part because it was like three in the morning for me or something ridiculous like that. Um, so, but still, um, to be able to access and talk to people through other means, so creating community through multiple ways, I suppose. So not just the community you create by being together uh, synchronously uh, in a Zoom call or in a classroom, let's say in the fall we go back to having classes in person, but to actually give alternative community spaces, whether it's on a Slack, whether it's on other kinds of groups that people form among themselves based on their appropriate time zones or whatever. So those are the three things I think I've taken away from a pedagogy aspect from this course. I'll go next. Um, I only TA'd once, but the lesson I learned from my TA, uh, rather the actual professor, was that um, when we're doing assessment, we cannot assess a student only by what they're speaking in class, right? So it's very serious. We need to assess in multiple ways, right? And I'm like, okay. And I never saw it play out so well until I took this class because um, while my co-panelists went over the great contacts and so forth. I think you guys have also heard we had Slack, we had a Canvas discussion board, we had annotation where we talked to each other, we had a synchronous and asynchronous space where we were able to engage um, with each other, um, show what we are learning, show what problems we have and so forth. And it just, it's a world above from just like giving out uh, dittos to the students and being like, pull this out so that I know that you're um, engaging with the material. It's like, here's these multiple ways for you to engage with the material and your classmates. So, and I think um, my teaching experience is so limited, but I feel that would be very um, opportunistic for students and to, for them to actually work through problems in a way that's more effective and coming from a place of empathy than um, previous teaching methods I have observed. That, that reminds me, there, there was one thing that hasn't come up, um, you know, in, in the things that students have mentioned, perhaps because it was more useful for me than them. Um, so now is probably a good time to mention it, um, was that one, one of the, the assignments was a weekly check-in with like just a set of questions like, what have you been doing this week? 
Um, and sometimes the answer was like, my life is falling apart. Like the world is in shambles. I have done nothing. Um, and that was okay too. Like I made it very clear up front that like, there will be weeks like this in fall 2020. And that is a perfectly legitimate answer. Like no stress, we'll figure it out. Um, you know, and, and um, I mean, the, the, the question that was often most helpful for me in shaping the next week was um, what have you been having problems with? Like what, what hasn't worked for you this week? Like, where have you gotten stuck? Um, and especially where, where, you know, you're not seeing the students in person um, and it may be sort of hit or miss in, in seeing them on Slack, um, being able to get, you know, just sort of like something on a weekly basis to see that like, they're all still alive. They're all still either doing things or not doing things, but that's okay either way. Um, and like, these are the things that like did or didn't work this week. Um, it was, was it really essential for, for how I was able to, to do this. Um, so yeah, just like little, little casual non-judgmental bits of feedback, um, you know, at least for, for the instructor angle, um, is, is really helpful with this kind of thing. I want to jump in and say that those check-ins were incredible and, have a similar principle behind them, I think, as what the course, as the thing that I most want to take to my future teaching, which is assessments that are structured to build on each other so that every assignment you do sort of is the next piece of the puzzle and eventually it all turns into your final project. Um, I am very fond of a meme that sort of makes fun of advice that says, you know, how to draw an owl. Step one, draw three circles. Step two, draw the rest of the owl. Um, and I think Quinn did a great job avoiding draw the rest of the owl pedagogy. Um, and I think that's applicable. You know, we've talked about language classes, but if I were teaching first year writing, for example, which is something that a lot of humanities PhD students end up teaching, I would really think about what are the pieces I can have my students do be that first you brainstorm a topic, then you do a lit review, then you do an outline, and really having each of those be an assignment so that at the end, there's a term paper, but you know each of the steps is designed to help you learn how to get there. Um, the use of assessment as a scaffolding and teaching tool was incredible. Yeah, I, I hate the the draw the rest of the owl thing. Um, and this this is this is such a problem, especially with like computational text analysis, where it's like, you know, you have a research question. And then you do blah, 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 magic at the end. And it's like, wait, 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 wait. Like, what's the blah, blah, blah? And how does that work? Why are we doing this? And also, like, what are we measuring? And how does that relate to my actual research question? Um, and trying to, like, break down all of those steps of, like, how you actually go from, I'm wondering about X to, like, well, we can't actually measure X, but, like, here are three possible proxies for X um, that we can think about. Which one of these seems like it might be the best idea to explore? Okay, we'll try that. And here are some things that we can attempt here. Um,